welcome uh, back uh, into uh, uh, our conference, CBE conference. Uh, just in case uh, you're joining us for the first time um, and haven't been here the rest of today, uh, I'm Charles Reed. I'm one of the two uh, London or uh, uh, well, UK based uh, organisers, along with uh, Amanda Jackson, who's going to be our speaker. Uh, and I, uh, I, I teach in, uh, in seminaries. Um, uh, as my paid job, uh, and it's a, it's great to uh, uh, to welcome uh, Amanda to uh, to speak um, here. Um, uh, Amanda and I, I say, have been the two people uh, uh, working with CBE uh, on the uh, uh, um, uh, British end of, of of putting this conference together. So as you imagine we've had many. Uh, <laughs> Quite, uh, quite, quite frantic difficult, <laughs> frantic and difficult Zoom calls, trying to keep one step ahead of the pandemic, and uh, and one step ahead of what the British government is going to do about the pandemic. Which, if you're a Brit, you'll know is an art in itself, because we're not even sure. Some days we're not sure what the government itself uh, thinks is going to do. But there we go. Um, uh, and I'm just going to um, just uh, so for those who haven't uh, um, met Amanda uh, before, uh, Amanda works uh, with the World Evangelical Alliance and is the director of the Women's Commission and has uh, many years experience encouraging um, um, uh, Christian advocacy uh, for women and addressing the challenges faced by uh, women and girls uh, in evangelical um, uh, circles um, uh, across the world, I think I'd to say. Um, uh, it's, it has been a delight uh, to work with Amanda um, on the, in setting this conference up. And um, uh, when we we hadn't met before, we were involved in this, uh, but uh, Mimi uh, had had and CBE put us in touch with each other. And so uh, we had a meeting at a cafe in London uh, near the Barbican, I think, when when I was in London for meeting. So it was like this, like out of a spy movie, where two people are meeting each other, but they don't know what each other look like. <laughs> you know, so I did kind of think, should I wear a huge carnation in my lapel or something? But we did manage to recognise each other and even have a coffee together. So, um, uh, but it's been a great delight to work with Amanda on this uh, at this conference, and a great delight now to uh, uh, to hand over to her. To, uh, uh, to lead us in this session on co-workers and co-leaders, women and men partnering in God's work. So Amanda, over to you. Um, thank you, Charles, for that lovely introduction. And um, boy, we've had some amazing stuff fed into us for the last sessions, if you've been with us the whole time live. Um, and I wanted to concentrate on women and men leading together. Um, why do I need to talk about this? Why do we need to talk about it? Because on the one hand, you'd think it was obvious. Things go better when all God's people are working on one as one body. And on the other hand, sex and gender are such divisive issues in some places that you might just want to walk away and get on doing our own thing separately, um, especially because the debate can get toxic and is inflamed by secular debates around gender and male hegemony. Um, it's been fantastic to listen to all of the different voices over the last little while and from CBE over many years, um, encouraging women to understand their place in God's story. Um, but I work with women in all sorts of places around the world and not all of them have access to that sort of encouraging teaching. I hear many stories from women who simply want to use their gifting fully, who just want to be listened to by their husbands. So hearing stories of healthy co-working can be a powerful way of overcoming misunderstanding or tradition, especially if pastors end up with daughters, they suddenly realize that their beautiful girls, their wonderful daughters um, may have some gifting from God. Where do we go from there? It has to be about more than just um, educated and articulate women getting the benefit of all this wonderful learning too. It has to be the sorts of women across evangelical churches across the world who find it hard to access good teaching, women from honour and shame cultures, women who are weighed down by everyday life and don't have much time for webinars. So how can we 
get some practical positive input in. And so I guess my topic comes from that sort of desire to get around the barriers. Um, how do we find ways to overcome the stereotypes of what traditionalists call biblical manhood and biblical womanhood, as if you believe anything else, you're not believing the Bible? Well, we've certainly been corrected on that by wonderful teaching from Mimi and John and Lucy and Andrew and others who are still to come. And I did notice in the chat, by the way, yesterday, someone was saying, is there a good version of the Bible that does reflect more fully some of the, um, the scholarship that we've been talking about? And I'm just going to hold this one up and I'll put it in the chat later. It's the CEB Bible and it stands for Common English Bible. Dot com. I've only bought my copy, um, you know, in the last couple of months, but it is really good on examining some of those key problematic um, passages and talking about them really well in the notes. So that could be something that would be helpful for some of us. So in my work, most of the people I deal with, most of the women and the men, belong to complementarian churches in some form or other. And we all know that that's a pretty wide spectrum of churches. Um, but it goes something like this, doesn't it? The church or the organization, um, it might be an organization that holds complementarian views, values men and women equally. It says we're equally gifted and equipped by God, but there's a but. We are also different in the responsibilities we have. Men are given roles of leadership, preaching, and major decision-making. I liked Natalie's uh, three Ds of doctrine, discipline, and dying. While women make valuable contributions in family life, with other women, and with children. Women have a supportive role. Helper and submission get used a lot. Husbands make a lot of their wife's good looks. I married of my pay grade is a phrase I've heard a lot. And somehow it never means that the man is admiring his wife's intellect or spiritual clout or her earning ability. And if I look at websites for churches or parachurch organizations in this category, the senior leadership will all be male. Perhaps there'll be a male in an admin role or a children's pastor or the human resources manager. And the leaders will be married couples where the husband is the actual leader, although they'll always show the husband and wife together, while his wife is a loyal support. Now, I could get very cynical. Where are the single people in this picture of uh, leadership? The women who have supportive husbands, the man and the woman who really are an equal team and might take turns to dip in and out of different roles, depending on what is happening in their lives and family. And even in contexts sometimes where men are genuinely wanting to see women thrive in all areas, why doesn't it happen? I'm not going to tackle the key passages because we've had some great teaching and you can read lots of books about it, but equipped with that biblical research, and with an understanding of how culture seeps into our thinking, we want to look at Bible stories and practical ideas that can help. So I'm going to look, try to find some ways of communicating that start where people are at, but move us beyond. And Jesus did that all the time. Look at the way he used words like neighbor, family, sin, healing, forgiveness. I want to look to start with one key relationship that Jesus had, and it's with his mother, Mary. Mary's song about her unborn son that comes at the beginning of Luke is a wonderful reminder from a young single girl of how God uses the lowly to bring about his purposes. Falling pregnant in this completely strange way will be viewed as an affront to family honour. But Mary rejoices in God, her saviour, and she reminds all generations about God's radical nature. And I think when we slip back into tradition and we talk about traditional family values or biblical womanhood or manhood as if they are unchanging and immutable things, 
um, we forget that God's kingdom is radical, that God's plan from the beginning has been radical. And Mary's wonderful song says, God has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered the proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. I love the way that Joseph is prepared to support her through the potential disgrace of the pregnancy. And because he too has an encounter with an angel in a dream, right there at the beginning of the gospel story, we see a man and a woman trying to work together, pondering together to understand the amazing things that are happening. Joseph was at some times a supportive onlooker. And at other times, for example, when they escaped to Egypt, he must have been the leader and protector. It's a strong family. But Jesus also plays around with the idea of family. Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? He once asked. And pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Now, putting aside the Jewish love of poetic exaggeration, this st statement, which is Matthew 12, is establishing that in the kingdom of God, family is an inclusive term for all followers, whatever their age, gender, or status. And if he was pointing to his disciples when he's mentioned brothers and sisters, there must have been some women in the group as well as men. And I find this passage particularly interesting because in contexts where traditional families values are held up, it becomes a reason for women to be full-time mothers, to be homemakers, uh, to do homeschooling perhaps. And it's interesting that Jesus is being much more radical in his view of family. He sees it as broader than the nuclear family, certainly. It's intergenerational, it's men and women from different social classes working together, being brothers and sisters, sharing responsibilities, not seeing each other as threatening. We see this clearly in his last hours on the cross. And despite all the suffering that he's going through, he shows compassion for his mother and the disciple whom he loved very much, and that's John. Jesus asks John to look after Mary, which is a fairly typical thing, you'd think. Okay. Look, here is your mother. Look after this woman who is a widow. But he also asks her to take care of him. Woman, here is your son. And we are told from that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Now, it can't be just Jesus making sure that Jesus, his mother is being looked after. She's got other sons, remember who could do that duty. So he must be setting up a relationship of mutual support and learning. Mary can pass on stories and experiences and spiritual wisdom, as well as provide some practical care to John. And he can add his insights and care to her life. And I think it's interesting that it's only in John's gospel that we find the story of the wedding at Cana. And the description has details that only Mary would know. So it was a wonderful establishment of a new sort of relationship that Jesus was worried about even on the cross. If we want the good news to be truly good news, we need to model healthy, equal relationships of women and men reaching out to society. And we are going to lose the next generation if we don't address this quickly and completely, not just as a response to what's happening in society, because we should never just be responding to what is going on around us, but because it's what God wanted from the beginning. If we've heard all of those talks that we've heard this weekend, that's something we've heard. It's on God's heart. Across the world, Stories have emerged in the last decade of many new house churches led by women, especially in places where the church is under persecution. It is faith emerging from dreams and visions, chats with other women, and a real sense that Christianity can transform culture where women are second class. The 
perhaps because the churches meet in homes over a meal or conversations happen at the market, women are well placed to lead that evangelism process. And there's lots of evidence that suggests that when men and women use their gifting equally, the church flourishes. I met an amazing woman in a country in Central Asia, which I won't name for you because it's still under persecution. She was in her 70s when I met her. She was a tiny woman, I, I don't know, about four foot eight, 145 centimeters. But she had answered God's call to go to the poorest part of the country, to one of the Muslim minority groups, to tell them about Jesus. She was in her 50s when she went and she left her family behind. She planted over 70 house churches. Her daughter and son-in-law were carrying on in that mode, risking persecution to run a church network in their city. Luba is the gifted pastor of the couple and her husband, Kolya, runs a business to support them and is also a leader in various ways to the men. They have always refused to accept funds from American mission agencies, which I find amazing. And you know, one of the big reasons they give is because they do not want men to take over. I've been privileged to work with churches in places like Benin, which is in sort of Northern Africa, in Paraku, which is the second biggest city of the country. The first time I went, I was invited to preach in a church on the Sunday. It was a wonderful service, great music, dancing, kids, food, chaos. It was only afterwards that I learned that the church had been started by a French woman missionary about 90 years before. But since her passing, they had never had another woman preacher. How confused our thinking can be when we allow culture to take over from God's original inspiration. But something of her must have lasted because I'm so thrilled that now the churches in Paraku are fully involved in addressing the needs of women and children. And I've thought about it. And it's because, first of all, there were two wonderful men who sat down and listened to the women and involved them in all the decisions in the church and in the development work they were doing. It also helped that the leader of the French mission agency in the city was a woman and that the woman who led the national women's group for the whole of Benin was a strong advocate a no nonsense leader. So all those people came together at the time, together equally. The women and men, one of the wonderful things they did was they organized together a march on City Hall to call for better maternal health services. And they also won important improvements for children and baby care, as well as for maternal health. It was a brilliant campaign. They also campaigned for the rights of poor farmers for men who had no legal right to their land and were facing having that land being taken away from them. And they successfully fought for the men to have their land ownership recognized. The church is growing because families are stronger, men and women are coming together to care for each other and people are released into their gifts. We're going to watch a story of what can happen in another part of the world when we're bold enough to be different. Annie's going to start the video for us and Leslie is going to tell the story. I just want to give a quick story of how this has worked out. Um, we, I'm not going to name the country or the people group. This is an area of the world where this particular people group was considered an unengaged, unreached people group. That means there's no one in the world focused on this group. 
So we were friends and partners, ministry partners with a person from this nation, and we gave him this list of unengaged, unreached people groups from his nation. And we said, do you have access to any of these groups? Well, there was one particular group that he had access to, and he said, yeah, I think we could get to them. They're a few hours from where our, our brothers and sisters live. And he said, yeah, I think we can do that. Let me go back and find out you know, if anyone wants to step up and figure out a way to get to this group. He said, but this group is challenging because they are very strong Muslims and they're known to not want outsiders to come in. So he goes to the, to, to the brothers and sisters and they decide, yeah, we'll send some people in. So he contacts us again and he's our ministry partner. And he said, yeah, we have, we're, we're willing to find some brave you know, men who say they'll go in. And we pushed back a little bit and we said, do you think it needs to be just men? Because in Genesis 1 and 2, the way God first established it was that man and woman would do things together. And he said, oh, 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 we don't do things like that in our country. And we said, well, why not? And we kind of knew why not, but we said, why not? And he said, well, because women are our honor. And so we protect them. And so therefore that we wouldn't send them into this area because they are our, our honor. And we said, well, what do you, what would happen, do you think, if you were to just say, we're going to obediently use the Genesis 1 and 2 model since Jesus has redeemed us and we go back to that original model? And he said, I'll go back to, to this group of people. So he goes back to the brothers and sisters and they pray. And sure enough, there's some strong men and strong women that say, we will, we will do it. And so there were two married couples and there were two singles that said, we're going to go in. And I know the story that they weren't like the heroic, you know, people that were willing to give their lives for Jesus on the spot. They were like us. They were ordinary people, a bit nervous to go into this group, but they said, we're going to do it. So they pray, they fast, they go into this group and the leaders of the village walk out and they are all armed with guns. And they look at the, this entourage of six people and they look at them and they introduce themselves and they say, well, you can come in. And so the believers are very nervous and the women are immediately taken to a woman's area. The men are taken to another area. They both eat. The women eat with the women, the men eat with the men. They're both learning about this unengaged, unachievable group, a group the church has never cared about. They found out their needs. They found out their hopes and their dreams for their children. So as the day continued on, they found out ways that maybe this group of believers might could help and just kind of enter in. But at the very end of the visit, this, some of the village leaders, they said, we want you to come back, but first we want to ask you, do you know why we did not hurt you when you came in? And the Christian said, yeah, we would like to know why you did not hurt us. And he said, if you would have come in with just the men, we would have thought you had come to hurt our honor. And we would have retaliated before you could even hurt our honor. And we would have either killed you or we would have hurt you. But when we saw you came in with women, we realized you were trusting us with your honor, so we chose to trust you with ours, and we allowed you in. And so um, through that story, now there's the first believer in this unengaged, unreached people group. We just started a school in this area where girls for the first time in their lives have been allowed to go into school. There's still lots and lots of work to do, but I think the story demonstrates that when we do things theologically the way God, that reflects God, and when we are willing to take the risk to obey scriptures the way God has allowed them to be placed down in the Word, God's Spirit will always rest on those things. And it opened up a people group to the gospel, but not only that, it saved the brothers. So the women really, literally, God used the women to save and protect the brothers that said they would also go in. So I think it just shows that strong theology is important, risk and courage is important to get the gospel to the last remaining unreached people groups, and the shared dominion and partnership is an idea of God that He wants to bless, and He wants to bless it much more abundantly throughout the earth. Thanks, Annie. Um, it's a great story, isn't it? Um, and there are some wonderful little takeaway lines there about, you know, the, the men's initial reasoning was that we don't do it that way. We don't, you know, send women in. We don't work with women. It would just be good to send men in. And the amazing um, protection and coverage and change that came about because they were willing to risk sending men and women in together. And um, I work quite a lot in um, Muslim um, contexts, in Muslim 
majority nations. And I talked to people who are, you know, mission groups or taking the gospel in or working with local believers. And they have said to me in the past that they don't feel that they can um, question um, the, the role of women. They're not there to do that. They're there to take the gospel. They're not to, there to muck around with social context or tradition or culture. And I think that video shows very clearly that we are there precisely to do that, to bring God's culture and values, um, rather than just thinking that um, human values are untouchable, um, especially if they're not ours. Okay. Right from the start, obviously in the Garden of Eden, God created women to be Isa Konegdo, that Hebrew term that is translated into English as helper, but which does not imply lesser or only an assistant. God knew man could not thrive without a partner. We just saw that in the video. The concept of Isa is that we cannot do our work alone. We support each other, we carry each other in times of crisis. And God is described as our Isa 16 times in the Old Testament. What a distortion to God's good creation plan when we say that women must be somehow lesser or inferior. The misunderstanding of our roles and gifting doesn't just limit women. And that's why I want to stress this idea of us both being together as co-workers. It has a negative impact on men too. It encourages unhealthy models of leadership that set off unwanted explosions. And I think the, the men who are part of this, this conversation online over the last couple of days are wonderful examples of men who've resisted um, the worst aspects of you know, male power. And we need to be working together because models of leadership where power and celebrity and male testosterone are promoted can be toxic. And we know that's true in the United States and in the UK, but it also creeps in wherever American mission agencies and churches are doing their wonderful work overseas go, they take that thinking with them as well. Just in the last year, there have been repeated reports of various men in Christian leadership, in two cases only after their deaths, turned out to have been involved in ongoing sexual and psychological abuse. And it's very upsetting. I've been saddened not just by the harmful behavior, but by the response of other male Christian leaders who grant forgiveness to these men, publicly excusing them by saying, oh, we're all sinners, we all have failings. Well, yes, we do, it's true, we're all sinners. But leaders have responsibility. Quick forgiveness pays no heed to the victims of these men and dishonors the name and reputation of God. In churches, if we have men and women and people from all sorts of mixed backgrounds teaching, we might get healthier interpretation of key passages that deal with male-female relationships. And we might have healthier appraisal of behavior and a better chance to stay servant-hearted. Think about the way men preach about David and Bathsheba in 2 Samuel chapter 11. It's a famous story. David is a hero of the faith. We are told that his whole heart was after God. So how do preachers deal with David's behavior towards Bathsheba? The account begins by telling us that David should not have been idle in Jerusalem. Verse one tells us it was spring, the time when kings go to war, but David wasn't at war, he was in Jerusalem. He went up on the roof in the evening and saw a woman bathing. And bathing in the evening was a common thing to do in the cool of the night. He finds out that this woman is married to one of his army officers. So on several instances there, you know there are alarm bells. David should turn away, but instead he sends for her. 
some male commentators say that Bathsheba must have acted provocatively and seduced David. There is absolutely no evidence for that interpretation. David is in a position of power. Bathsheba cannot really say no to the king. You could say it is rape or at least coercion. Notice how she doesn't even say anything in this story. And go and have a look at it afterwards. She does not say one word until she says, I am pregnant. And this emphasizes her lack of agency and her despair. Her reputation and honor are ruined. David has power. And the temptation for many leaders is to abuse their position. Sex and money are the two biggest weaknesses. We see it in individuals, but we also see it in the whole institution of the church. In so many instances, wanting to cover up sin rather than to confess. David manipulates, he covers up, and we know the story. Soldiers die needlessly. Bathsheba's husband is disposed of. And David's commander and Bathsheba are both drawn into the web of lies. We need to tell this story as an example of David's weakness and not gloss over the sexual exploitation and not gloss over the consequences either. It will help to counter the distorted image of leadership that reflects the fall and the fact that we've absorbed celebrity culture into celebrity pastors. We've forgotten to maintain a servant heart. We've forgotten to be humble. We read about this everywhere in the Bible. Leaders who allow selfishness or greed or power to weaken them and impact their witness. As women, we must remain vigilant not to fall into the traps that male leaders have tumbled into. And because we do not have so much leadership baggage, maybe we do have the chance to demonstrate healthy models for leadership, especially if we embrace being co-workers. We need to celebrate the Bible stories of working and leading together. Okay, and I'm just going to look at a few of them just so that we can be encouraged that they do exist because there's a lot of dysfunctional family and male-female relationships in the Bible, but there are some instances where it does work. Deborah. Deborah and Barak. Again, this is a story that some male commentators don't know how to handle. Deborah is a judge for Israel, respected for her prophetic wisdom. You'll find the story in Judges chapter four and five. She's a judge just at the time when Canaan is cruelly oppressing the people. And as evidence of that, it says they had 900 iron chariots, which was just a completely awesome array of power. After years of oppression, the people finally cry out to God. God hears their cry and Deborah hears God. She has the right message for the right time, and it involves gathering the army. So she calls for help for a co-worker, a co-leader. She sent for Barak, whose job description across his chest said, army commander. She has a direct message from God for him, and I quote, the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, go, take with you 10,000 men up to Mount Tabor, I will lead Sisera, the Canaan commander, into your hands, says God. Well, despite such a direct instruction, Barak was reluctant and he said to Deborah, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go, I won't go. Deborah does agree to go with him. And remember, she says quite famously, but because of the course you are taking, she says, the honour will not be yours where the Lord will deliver Sisera, the enemy commander, into the hands of a woman. Good leadership is about encouraging others to see what God is saying. And if we've got men leaders who are afraid to relate to women, then you're not going to get that encouragement. 
if you've got women who feel that they can't approach a man because it's going to be interpreted as some sort of inappropriate advance, then you're not going to get that co-encouragement and mentoring. Preachers have used this passage, this story, as an example of what happens when men don't take up the call to lead. It's left to a woman to do it. And they assume that delivering Sisera into the hands of a woman is a huge tragedy. Such misinterpretation. Deborah should be celebrated as the best judge in the Book of Judges. She has intelligence, spiritual insight, and a heart after God and collaborative methods. Barak wins the battle. And you may, may remember that there's this added twist of JL killing the enemy commander with a tent peg, which makes lots of male commentators quite scared as well. It seems to me that in times of desperate pressure and probably especially dangerous for women, JL and Deborah show bravery and strategic intelligence. There's so much more to draw out of that story. And they do it in concert with Barak and thousands of ordinary soldiers who join the call to fight. In chapter five, Deborah and Barak sing an amazing song of worship. I think it's mainly Deborah's song, to be honest. She is a worshiper. And she says in verse seven, I arose a mother in Israel. What does that term mother in Israel conjure for you? I guess we might have some stereotypes, but stereotypes are stereotypes because they're actually true. It's when you use them to um, limit any other thinking that they become dangerous. But a mother, what do we think of? Caring, nurturing, wise, strong, pushing her children on, seeing potential, life-giving. We need different models of leadership success different to alpha male models. And that's why co-working, co-leading can be so vital and so pos positive. And I think the idea too of a different model of leadership is it allows for failure. It allows for the fact that we might get different things happening in our lives at different times. Deborah was a faithful judge for many years, apparently, before the time came for her and Barak to deliver the nation. A parent might get sick, needs our care. Women might have babies. We take time to study. We feel crushed by divorced. We don't get the big job we feel we should have. Somehow these things, these life events seem to impact women more than men. Men cruise on, <laughs> whereas women need to take time out more. And we've seen that especially during COVID. Women have shouldered home responsibilities, again, much more than men. Homeschooling, looking after the house, looking after elderly people who are fragile. But it, we could see it as a positive if we have a different model of leadership. Suffering and difficulty are often the beginnings of doing something wonderful. And if we have co-workers lifting up our eyes when arms when times are tough, then we're all the better for it. Since the fall brought struggle between men and women into the world, men hold sway. And yet it's amazing how fearful they get when they feel challenged. Many Christian men I speak to are suspicious of feminism because they, they feel left out, they feel redundant. Where's my leadership if women, you know, are they gonna take over? Conservative megachurch leaders in the Gospel Coalition spoke of the feminization of the church as if that was a really terrible thing, as if the church isn't made up of over 60% women anyway. They called for strong men to be protectors and providers and make all the big decisions. But if we look at the Bible with more than just a children's adventure mindset, we see women and men and men and women together bringing in the kingdom. I'd love to have time to look at the story of Hannah, but we don't. So I do urge you to go to that wonderful story at the beginning of um, 
the the book of um, I can't even remember the name of the book now, but I'm sure someone will put it into the chat. Um, that really echoes Mary's experience as well. But I want to come to Paul as my last example because when I was a young woman, and you know, for quite a long time after that, I think a lot of you, like me, um, thought that Paul was a misogynist. Um, those verses that were thrown at me all the time about limiting me, or that they were just sitting there as an assumption that men were in charge. But good Bible scholarship shows us a different story. And we've had several people like Andrew and Mimi and Lucy in particular, giving us a different perspective on what those verses are actually about. But I just want to look at Romans 16. Paul modeled co-working. He had no disciples. He did mentor younger leaders, but he didn't have a hierarchy. He had associates, friends, co-workers with whom he labored side by side. And we heard that wonderful description of uh, Adam and Eve being created side by side, men and women. Look at the women he names in Romans 16. And we've already heard about some of these women, but it's great to be reminded that this is Paul speaking, Paul affirming so many women. Phoebe is called a servant of the church who has been a sponsor or a financial supporter of many people, including Paul. And we heard from Mimi how she carried Paul's letter to Rome. She would have read the letter, not just handed it over. It's a big responsibility. Priscilla and Aquila are called co-workers. They risked their lives for Paul. A church met in their house. And in Acts 18, we learn that they were both given responsibility and presumably were equipped to teach and were given responsibility to correct Apollos, a leader who didn't quite understand some aspects of faith. Priscilla is often named first. Now, perhaps that means she had higher status or perhaps simply she was the stronger, more upfront one in the relationship. Mary is named and commended simply because she worked hard. Junia has been in prison with Paul and with Andronicus, perhaps who's her husband, we don't know, is prominent among the apostles. That word that Bible scholars have argued about because they can't bear the thought that Junia might have been an apostle. In fact, they've argued that Junia wasn't a woman until they couldn't prove it anymore. Tryphena and Tryphosa are workers in the Lord. The mother of Rufus is referred to as Paul's spiritual mother. Other women are simply referred to as saints. They were named alongside men or on their own. They were men and women from different backgrounds and all are beloved friends family who labored with Paul. They are, and the word is used, striving, fighting is used, teaching, sharing prison cells with their brothers in faith. That sounds like equality to me. That sounds like standing side by side. The early church welcomed men and women, Jews and Gentiles, wealthy patrons, fishermen, surely we should do the same. Leading as Jesus showed us is an adventure of collaboration, dreams, caring and trust in the mighty power that comes only from God. And I want to finish uh, by talking about a statement that was produced and Mimi was one of the, the 60 women who gathered a couple of years ago to write this statement. And it was um, unanimously approved by the World Evangelical Alliance and the Lausanne Network, two of the, the big global evangelical networks. It was a prophetic moment really, celebrating the contribution of women to the church and recognizing that gender equality continues to be a barrier that diminishes the effective witness of the church 
to the transforming power of the gospel. The statement affirmed that Jesus came to bring fullness of life to all people and the gospel is good news for women and girls, men and boys. The call is showing that leadership in the church is not a competition. And if we affirm women, we are certainly not sidelining men. If we don't get this right, how can we have anything worthwhile to say about gender issues, abortion, domestic abuse, trafficking, pornography, narcissistic leaders, let alone bringing the gospel? If we do get it right, we release women and men to build the sort of kingdom envisaged by Paul when he says that there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. We do have a little bit of time for a breakout room for about six minutes, I think. And I would just love you to discuss um, what you think of those Bible examples that show men and women being co-workers. And maybe if you have got any time to think about some practical ways that we can take this forward. So uh, Annie, I don't know whether you could put us into breakout rooms, that would be brilliant. Yep. So that would be fantastic. And then we'll come back and it'll be dinner time or lunch time for a well deserved right. break. And again, if you don't want to participate in a breakout room, you can share your thoughts in the chat. I think that's fine. Thank you, Annie. Okay, I think people are in the rooms. Should be getting the notification. Hi Annie, thank you for doing that. And thank you, the video worked perfectly. <laughs> Good. I'm so glad. You're so welcome. You've done an awesome job. <laughs> thank you. I can't believe how fast it's all going by. <laughs> Send you the, the notes if you, um, from what I've just said, someone saying will the notes be added? Um, I can sure, if you have anything written that is shareable, then I can put that as a document on Whova. I'm just wondering whether you could put the Vimeo link as well. Yeah. It, it's a great little video. She's an amazing woman and she tells the story really well. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Two more minutes, good? Yeah. All right. Yeah. I think people are ready for a break. <laughs> I'll just put the, the Bible thing in as well.
All right, people will be coming back in about 50 seconds. Hi everyone, as you're coming back. We haven't got very much time, but if anyone would love to put anything into the chat and um, just about things you discussed or whatever, um, I'm gonna put give my, send my notes to Annie, um, happy for anyone to use them. Um, and the video as well. I think the video is just a great, um, five minute way to win people over because um, Leslie is such a persuasive woman and um, a great example she and her husband of totally mutual um, you know working together and leadership uh, and she her story is great as well because she comes from a you know fairly typical complementarian church and how they discovered together um, that there was a different way Yep, one group talked about Paul as well, and how we've we've sadly um, got the wrong end about him not really liking women, being a misogynist. So Mimi's talk today was great for giving us a different insight. Although there are still some confusing things that are said, and it's really hard to know about for sure about some of them, I must admit. Um, another person is recommending a good Bible. I've put down the CEB Bible there. Um, but someone else is recommending uh, something from the Fuller Theological Cent uh, Old Testament and the New Oxford Annotated Bible. Um, yeah, the importance of Romans 16. It's interesting, isn't it, that Romans is the book that everyone goes to for doctrine and um, theology, but um, that last chapter is the outworking of that doctrine and theology. So it's a, a great chapter to refer to. Someone else says, be encouraged, dear sisters and brothers, change is possible when the Holy Spirit moves along among like-minded people. Our ministry has expanded so much since we first attended a CBA conference, and that's really good. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I think I'll leave it there because I think people are probably very um wanting to go and get some lunch or some dinner Charles, that's you. that's great thank you very much amanda that's just been fantastic in uh, um both setting setting up the biblical examples and uh, some of the kind of you know the, the framework of that but that also the uh, the video of how it might work today uh, that's really really helpful i think that's encouraged people to carry on even when they're sometimes in very difficult circumstances um uh, so so that's been great thank you so much uh, i'll say a prayer in a minute just to um uh, conclude uh, but uh, we have a break now for uh, lunch or dinner or whatever you call the food you're about to have wherever you live in the world um it's bad enough in the uk where we call the uh, the, the, the evening meal different things in different parts of the uk um uh, so where i grew up in the midlands uh, we would could we call this tea time now but I don't think you have that phrase in it's quite the same way in the States, let alone in the South of England. So thank you all. So we'll come back in an hour's time for the uh, next couple of sessions uh, and you can find them on the agenda. But let's just say a prayer uh, as we um, uh, conclude uh, today. Oh, it's 10 a.m. in Los Angeles. Yeah, OK. Time for morning coffee then in Los Angeles. Uh, let, let us let's pray. Uh, generous God, we thank you for all the gifts you give to us, and especially now we thank you for the gift of the uh, learning and encouragement uh, we get from these uh, sessions at the CBE conference, and uh, pray you'll help us to put them into practice, help us to see ways of doing that. We thank you for all that um, 
uh, you have given us through the presentations today. And we thank you too, uh, generous God. We thank you uh, for the food and drink you give us um, in whatever we're about to consume in our break now. We thank you for it and for those who have uh, produced it and prepared it for us. Amen.